hopefully there's more regulation uh, added to the financial industry because they want people to have a little more transparency with what they're giving their money for and what they're investing in. Republicans tend to side more on the financial side, meaning that free, more of a free market idea, competition, um, you know, they, they leave it a little bit more up to the consumer. Uh, Democrats tend to protect the consumer a tad bit more in our industry. And so moving forward, uh, the worry is that Hillary is going to double down on Obamacare and what that means is that for the financial industry, there's already been a ton of regulation, very expensive. Um, basically, when we give advice, we get charged now. It didn't used to be that way. We've got to send out all the supplementation to people that we talk to to give them an idea on what they're investing in. That didn't used to be that case. So if she gets elected, that's gonna, we're going to have to change. I'm going to have to get another license, which is going to be about $10,000 investment for American Century. And this is just for me. And there's like 20 other people that do what I do. So very expensive. And then if Trump gets elected president, um, there might be a huge party at, at my, where I work because <laughs> he's going to cut capital gains rates, at least is what he's hinted at. And there's a couple other loopholes that he might introduce for uh, advisory firms like American Century that will help us. And um, with uh, the regulation with Hillary, um, talk about the fiduciary thing that you did this morning on how your role, how your role as an advisor is potentially being a little more dictated by the government through the, like the, give a little more flavor to that regulation. Yeah. So uh, when you're giving a guidance, so that, like the financial industry divides it up into two different groups, either you're guiding people or you're advising people. Guidance is like guidance is where the client makes their own decisions, but you're just sort of giving them information and they do it all on their own terms. Advice is like, this is what you need to do. Give me your money and I'll invest it for you. And so if Hillary gets elected president right now, the way things are is that we're operating under guidance, which means it's not, it doesn't cost us anything to provide guidance to clients or just helping them with their money. But what I'm going to do, what's going to happen is if she gets elected, they're going to restructure the term guidance and it's going to mean advice. And so what that means is that right now we would be turned into a fiduciary and a fiduciary is a, a major organization that provides advice as, as its primary line of business. Right now we're able to file taxes and say that the guy or the advice piece is not our main part of our business. Our products are our main type of business. And so there's going to be a big change uh, and, and a lot more money being spent on trying to figure out the loophole around that. How, how many different mutual funds do you have at American century in the portfolio? Uh, we have over 90. Right. Yep. So ranging from stocks all the way to bonds, all the way to money markets, international exposure, and all th across all three uh, sectors. And yeah. give, a, give a quick, I think a lot of these guys know this, but just I think it always helps to give a little bit of what a mutual fund is. <laughs> yeah, a mutual fund. So I think about it as like a huge pool of money. So like if all of you guys decided you didn't know what to invest your money in, everyone would take $10 out of their pocket and they'd give it to Russ and Russ would go invest the money for you guys as your portfolio manager. And so all of you guys are directly dependent upon the decisions Russ makes, but Russ is also dependent upon you guys pulling your money out at any given time. So it's a give take relationship. And so Russ as his job is to make money for you guys. He gets a small fee of that, whatever he makes you in return, he has to pass over 90% of what he does make onto you guys as interest so that that's your incentive for investing essentially. And just think it's just a huge pool of thousands of people that are doing it on a large scale. What, what's the average fee rate at American century anyway? The type of company we are, we don't charge fees um, like your Vanguard's fidelities. Um, they're a little bit set up differently. So they do charge fees. Typically it's about 2% of what you invest. So if you invest $10,000, you're looking at about 200, $200 uh, every transaction, which adds up. Um, and that's the load, right? That's the load, right. And then you have an expense ratio for each mutual fund that you have. So say that I invest in a large company fund, it's going to have an expense ratio of like 75.75%. What that means is like that, if I was to make a dollar, 75 cents out of that dollar is going to go to the mutual fund because they have to keep it up and running and it's how they pay the expenses for the fund yeah. on top of the fees. A hundred dollars on a hundred dollars, the 75 cents, 0.75%, right? Right. Yeah. right. You're right. Sorry. Yeah. 0.75. Yeah. 
And so that's one thing you got to look out for with mutual funds. But uh, okay, so let me pause there for a second. Questions for Max at this point? Yep, Tig. Talk real loud. You guys are in the debate, so how do you make your money as American? Yeah. So a lot of our money, or the only way we make money is by making other people money. So you give us $10, we invest it, and now you, you leave with $20. We take two out of that 10 that we're giving you. So you get 18 total and we get $2. So it's completely the profits we make for people. Yeah. And then there's some ancillary things we do. We, we do generate a little money off of guidance and stuff like that, people that pay for it. But that's not primarily what I do, at least. So it's based on the generation of the, of the money. If that helps. Okay. Oh. Um, how many financial advisors do you work with at a time? That's a great question. So like the way it's divided up is I have a territory. And so um, based, it's based on how good you are, how many, how many people you've converted, your dollar percentage and things like that. Last year I brought in like 10 million into American Century, which it was good, but I think the leader made, brought in like 16. And so I got like, it depends. So then when you get promoted, you get a territory based on what your previous performance was. And so I'm hoping to get California. I haven't been placed yet, but the country is divided up into territories, sort of like regions. So like one person gets all of Morgan Stanley's advisors in the Midwest. And then one person gets all of Morgan Stanley's advisors in California and Arizona. And it's just divided up that way. So there's, I mean, I, at any given time, I'll work with probably 10 to 15 um, but my goal is to narrow that down and really hone in on one or two, because if we can get one or two to really buy our products, then that's worth more in the long run than a bunch not buying anything, if that makes sense. Okay. Anything else at this point? You may talk right. about interest rates for us. Um, yeah, go for it. Yeah, I got another one that I'm going to ask you too, but yeah, go ahead and talk interest rates. I was just going to say um, one of my opening interview questions for the new job was uh, how are bonds and interest rates related? Do, do Have you guys learned that yet? Oh yeah, they better. I don't know how many of them remember. But... <laughs> so you really will get asked about random stuff and I, I paid attention that day in class. So I was able to answer the question, <laughs> but uh, they're, they're inversely related. And so a lot of people right now, because interest rates are very, very low. I'm not sure if you guys have reflected that at, at all, but this is one of the lowest periods we've ever seen of interest rates. And so interest rates are the cost of borrowing money or it's the cost of money, right, Russ? Yeah. And so if you think about it from, yeah, if you think about it from a business standpoint, it's very cheap for them to borrow money right now. And the federal reserve has indicated that they might raise interest rates over the next couple of years. And so it's just going to affect the market a lot. And so that's, there's a lot of volatility going on right now. I'm not sure if you guys know, but it's been up and down this year and around the election time, it's going to get really, really volatile because again, people base everything they do off of expectation, not necessarily facts. And so, and it's all based on what they hear on CNN. So if you guys hear interest rates, just know that there's a chance there might be movement. Say what, what, what was the action like in your office the uh, afternoon of the announcement Fortunately, this class fell on Wednesday at two, so we watched some of Janet's speech live here in the classroom. What was yeah. it like at the office that day? Um, well, we had the guys that had the really, really rich clients, they left early and went and partied <laughs> <laughs> because that means that their clients aren't pulling their money, it means they're going to keep, they're going to stay put because it's not, it's not going to get any more expensive for them to do business. Little guys like me, um, we just kind of went back to the phones. There was a lot of people that started calling, calling out uh, other advisors from other firms, trying to figure out what the consensus of the market was. Everyone wants to know the, you know, the secret essentially what everyone's going to do. And so, yeah, I, was, I would say the big wigs left and party and everybody else uh, kind of got, actually we got kind of upset because really the interest rates need to rise to a normal rate. So that yeah, it's a different conversation, but um but yes, yeah, so that's what we're worried about. Were you all uh, huddled around streaming, streaming the event when yeah. she put up the talk? Yeah. Basically, the comes to a screeching halt at until she makes her announcement. Yeah, in fact, I was on a call with somebody, and I said, "I'm sorry, the announcement's about to come out. I'm going to have to call you back." And 
and they weren't too happy about it, but we're allowed to do that. Cause that's like the Holy grail of yeah. information. Yeah. Yeah. It was kind of fun. I was watching some of the stock that I was popping those up on the screen while she was talking. So we saw some of that volatility that went on. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you about the robo advisor. You said oh, yeah. that was a new innovation. Why don't you explain to these guys what a robo advisor is? Yeah. So obviously all of us are aware of technology. Everything's getting crazy. We have Snapchat, things we never had 10 years ago or whatever. In the financial industry, everything's becoming automated. So like people are wanting to not pay. So after 2008 and all the greed and everyone found out about the, the bankers making all the money and screwing people over, the there was a huge shift in the industry from people wanting to receive information and advice from other people as opposed to like a neutral source. And so companies like Morgan Stanley and JP Morgan and things like that started paying for what's called AI, which is artificial intelligence, which is like they wanted to create a, a version of a person, but make it robotic so that there's no emotional connection and there's no way that the end client can trace back fraud or anything or any wrongdoing because it's a robot. And so essentially you call in to this robot and it's a ro it's a, called a robo advisor and they just basically tell you the robot asks you normal questions like a person would. It's, it's designed and, and, um, and programmed to have actual human like characteristics and pauses and stuff. And he makes a recommendation for you in your portfolio. So essentially it's, Everything I'm doing, there's a robot doing it um, for a lot cheaper. There's no fees and it allows people to, to do it on their own time as opposed to, you know, because American Century is only open eight to five. The robo advisor can stay awake around the clock. And so um, that's what, that's the direction people are, companies are heading as robo advisors. So it's pretty scary because <laughs> if we lose human contact, it could be possible in the next 10 years, you're calling to a robot and then you know, it could get, could get kind of confusing down the line. So it's kind of like uh, listening to Google girl, right? You, you ask your questions and then you get your responses. It's all automated. It's all automated. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like Google on steroids actually. Yeah. Like they can predict trend. They can predict what you're going to say before you say it. And it's real creepy. <laughs> oh really? Have you so you've done it? I mean, yeah. you, you, your company had had you, do it yeah, we, te we tested it. So my, my job was to try to confuse the robot. Huh. And, and so how, it was, how did the robot do? It, it beat me because it was able to, it could download data. Like it knew all my past addresses, everything. Like I couldn't, it's just instantaneous because it, it pulls all the information from the internet. And it basically follows a kind of a textbook recommendation. It listens to all your data that you're inputting, but then it kind of follows a, textbook recommendation of some sort, right? What are the drawbacks, I guess, is what I'm kind of, what are the professionals saying robots can't do very well? The first part is all the advisors are getting really, really upset because robots shouldn't be outperforming humans. <laughs> Second thing is that it's a robot. It doesn't have intuitive, I mean, you don't get the personal feel like, like me and you, you know, me talking to you. Um, and then the last thing is like the privacy um, piece is really worrying a lot of people because the robots have access and can download uh, information so much quicker than we can. And then they can dissolve it. I mean, they can like make sense of it and give us a recommendation quicker than it. I mean, it's just instantaneous. And so everyone's worried that this is going to be uh, the Will Smith movie. I robot or I am robot. I don't know if you guys have seen that. Yeah. That was like way long time ago, but yeah, people are worried that like this is the start of the robots and artificial intelligence taking over, and <laughs> yeah, um, the only but, thing they can't do is print money, which is good. Yeah. All right, questions so far. Yeah. How do sites like E-Trade affect your business? It's a great question. Um, so E-Trade is is not a business designed like E-Trade allows people to create their own accounts and manage their own. Like you, you go to E-Trade if you want to pick and choose your own stocks, like companies you want to invest your money in. American Century, we don't offer that. All we offer is mutual funds. So like if you're wanting just to invest in Facebook, you would go to E-Trade because you can buy individual shares of Facebook on E-Trade's platform. With us, we would have to find you a mutual fund that invests in Facebook or Facebook's like got a holding in it. Does that make sense? And so E-Trade gives like, you know, if you want to make your, choose your own investments and have complete 
autonomy of what your money's going to, then you go to E-Trade um, because you can do it all, literally all yourself and the fees are lower. Okay. Same with, uh, what else? Um, Amer Ameritrade, you guys have probably heard of Ameritrade. Yeah. 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 Um, at uh, uh, OU, you had uh, um, any advantages over some of your state school counterparts at, at your job? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, the critical thinking skills, like it sounds really, really cliche, but I mean, I've found that my friends that went to KU and K-State and Nebraska, like they're smart kids and everything, but they never – they're really good at identifying problems. Like they're really good at know noticing that interest rates are rising, but they don't really know what the next step is, which is the relationship between interest rates. How does that affect housing market? Like this is all stuff you guys talk about in Russ's classes. They don't really get that at, at the, uh, and so when you're sitting in, in an interview and you go ahead and play that scenario out for someone who's trying to hire you and you dictate to them that you show them that you understand, you know, the 360 degree view of what's going on. I mean, they, it just set you apart, set me apart. And I didn't even know a lot I, what I was talking about. I just tried to keep it simple. <laughs> so, and then obviously the connections, like I still talk with Russ and Dr. Moore and Mary Lou and everybody. That's something that bigger schools don't offer. So definitely take advantage of that because they can give you, I mean, I called Russ when I got my promotion and asked him what I should do. And he said, take the money. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I like getting those calls, so I'm my uh, continue to do that anytime. Uh, you didn't mention your MBA thing. That's kind of a cool part of your compensation. Yeah. Just tell them about that. So that's uh, so there's like when you when you take a job, there's our, there's direct benefits, and then there's what we call fringe benefits. Direct benefits are your actual compensation or your pay that you receive, and then fringe benefits are like 401k, your your paid time off, your health insurance, uh, tuition reimbursement, just things that like aren't I guess, directly related to your pay. And so one of the things that American Century does is tuition reimbursement. And for me, I don't know why I decided to, but I figured when I got out of school, I needed to get an MBA. Master's in business administration is what it is. And so, and the reason being is that the market for education is expanded. Like everybody has a college degree now and I wanted to, I need to, I, I wanted to stand out. And so uh, I signed up for an MBA at, at Mid-America and um, it's every eight weeks you take a class. So it really, my undergrad was way harder than the MBA has been. It's not been hard. Um, a lot more papers, but um, yeah. And I just did that to stand out and I would recommend it highly. Um, and how much is uh, yeah. uh, American Century reimbursing you? They're going to, uh, it's taking me about a year and a half. It's supposed to take two years, but I doubled down to try to get through it quicker. Um, so that's two classes a week for, uh, from six to 10 every night after work or two nights a week after work. And it's going to be about 20 grand. Uh, but because I'm finishing how fast, much, how much of the 20 grand is covered, I guess is what I was wondering. All, all 20 grand. But they, they give it, they, they give it to me and then I pay it. So I already have all the 20 grand. And right. so, so it's like a little bonus. <laughs> right. So I've been investing it. Okay. Questions from Max? Otherwise, we can jump right into some other money banking chapter 16 stuff here. So, <laughs> Hopefully, I didn't bore you guys. Is that helpful talking to get, get a little insight? So, well, Russ, I might, I might mention to him too, if you guys are interested in finance and do you think like this is something you want to deal with, like money or whatever on a daily basis, like when you graduate and work, American Century, if you just go to AmericanCentury.com um, forward slash careers, we have an internship that's getting ready to get posted. It's like, it's top five in the industry. Um, I, I don't know the pay. I think it's, I think it's $18 an hour, but I could be wrong. But the posting's going to happen pretty quick and it fills up pretty quick. So if you guys are interested, let me know and, and apply. And then that way I can get your guys' names in. Obviously, so you can for sure get an interview. And then from there, it's up to you guys. But last year, they took 20 interns. And it's a great summer job. Um, and then, you know, if you're not interested, that's not a problem, but at yeah. least you have it. That's awesome. Good. 
Yeah, forward that on to me when, when you get it too, and I'll make sure we get it posted on our internship leads. But especially yeah. for some of you guys who are nearing the end, if you want a cool internship, that would be a yeah. good spot. Yep. Yeah. All right. Um, I feel like I had one more thing, but I think we're good. All right. Sorry, I couldn't be there. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Duty calls. Uh, I appreciate you taking out a lot of large part of your day to talk to them, and yeah, I'd, uh, we'll have you back again sometime in the future. Okay. Yeah, you guys are more than welcome to add me on LinkedIn, uh, Max Brewer. Um, I'll drop off a couple contact points for Ross so he can distribute if you guys want. But seriously, however I can help, let me know. And best of luck to you guys. Okay comments on that in the micro class. I don't know if you talked to that at financial administration, but how important that turned out to be uh, your profile on LinkedIn. Oh yeah. 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 Maybe mention a couple words about that. Cause I thought that was really cool. Yeah. So we all know about social media nowadays and like the corporations are 10 light years ahead of like us, meaning individual people setting up our profiles. They've already got systems in place where if you apply for something online, they've got an algorithm that's going to generate three of your friends on LinkedIn. And then they're going to, that's going to create an alert for the uh, interviewer to ask you about. So for instance, when I went in for my interview at American century, I had my profile on LinkedIn set up and everything. Didn't think anything of it. And my advice or my, uh, ma the manager asked me why I was friends with these three people, these random three people. And I was like, how do you guys know them? <laughs> like, well, we just we just found that you were friends mutual friends on LinkedIn and one of your friends happens to have tattoos and all this stuff what are your what are your views about that and so that was something I was not ready for um, how did you respond to that one obviously you got the job so you pulled something up do you remember what you said yeah because <laughs> they, they still make fun of it. but uh, I said well I see tattoos as a way of expressing oneself <laughs> <laughs> Whether you agree or disagree with it, uh, I choose to be around people that are good and good friends to me. And so both of them like that answer. That's cool. So, but yeah, so LinkedIn, there's people checking your guys' stuff already right now because you're prospective seniors, juniors even. So I, I tidy that up if you can, uh, meaning get a professional picture done and then make sure you're watching who you're adding, what you're liking on LinkedIn. I don't really post that much. I leave that to Facebook. That's another thing. Turn your Facebook private, uh, profiles to private. Um, Snapchat is on the horizon, meaning they're going to be gaining access to your Snapchat down the road, maybe five to 10 years, but it's going to happen. So watch out who you snap, who your friends are. Um, and then also recruiting through uh, LinkedIn. Don't post on your Facebook. Uh, don't go to the company's website to apply necessarily. Go through LinkedIn, find someone on LinkedIn inbox them that way and then follow your your inbox with them up with uploading your resume to the company's website that way you've got a point of contact huh i don't even understand that but it sounds like a good idea <laughs> so all right any other questions there on social media stuff because i thought that was cool you also said to post your resume as a uh, mobile friendly oh yeah yeah mobile friendly is huge too. yeah so you have different ways of posting it so that it because he said that the person that you ended up interviewing pulled it up on their phone actually, right? It was how yeah. you had contacted. So it yeah. really worked that way. They say most managers have on average two minutes to review your um, thing. And so a lot of them do it on the train ride home or on a plane ride or whatever. And so they pull it up on their phone. So to make yours mobile friendly, you just save it as a PDF and then clip the margins so that it's, it's a little bit smaller. And then that way when they pull it up on their mobile device, it'll, uh, It'd be friendly, and that's mine. At my out of a whole group of sixteen applicants, mine was the only one that was mobile friendly, and so that's why I got the job. Yeah, a good way to rise to the top. All right, any last last comments now for Max before we let him go? Let him get back to work, start earning the paycheck. Yeah, right. Making those phone calls. Yeah. All right, little hand for Max. All right, guys. Thank you. We'll, uh, we'll chat with you later. Thanks. All right. Next time, we'll have to uh, make sure that you can stick around for a beer, because that, that was our original plan. We were going to go to El Mezcal. Yeah. So, next time. We'll make that happen. All right. We'll talk to you later. Bye. 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 <laughs> All righty. <laughs>
Before I even get this set up, let me have what we're going to do. We're going to do a little reading. Yeah, sign in. Go ahead and get that going around. Okay, I got two things. One is, uh, one is uh, the back side of this is what we went over before. So this is just kind of for your uh, input. That's what we did on. Uh, Wednesday. <laughs> and then the back part is what we're going to work on here in the meantime. So pass those around. <laughs> okay. Um, so once we get those around, all right, make it around. Let's do a little round robin reading. We're gonna do a little pop popcorn reading. Reading is that what it's called? I don't do it enough to know that it's popcorn reading, so. All right, so we're not going to make it all the way around, but um, let's see. Why don't we just do a paragraph at a time? We'll start over here with Sheldon. The Federal Reserve Bank of New York plays a special role in the Federal Reserve System for several reasons. Its first its <coughs> district contains many of the largest commercial banks in the United States, the safety and soundness of which are paramount to the health of the U.S. financial system. The Federal Reserve Bank of New York conducts examinations of banks within companies and states chartered members in the bank's districts, making it the supervision of some of the most important financial institutions in our financial system. Not surprisingly, given the responsibility of the bank supervision group is one of the largest units of the New York Fed it is by far the largest state of supervision group in the Federal Reserve System. Okay, Kurt, you can go. The second reason for the New York Fed special role is its active involvement in the bond and foreign exchange market. The New York Fed houses the open market desk, which conducts open market operations. The purchase and sale of bonds that determine the amount of reserves in the banking system. Because of this involvement, the Treasury security market has well. It's one business location in New York Stock Exchange. The officials of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York are in constant contact with the major domestic financial markets in the United States. <coughs> in addition, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York houses the foreign exchange Act, which conducts foreign exchange intervention on behalf of the Federal Reserve System and the U.S. Treasury. This involvement in these financial markets means that the New York Fed uh, is an important source of information on what is happening in domestic and foreign financial markets, particularly during the crisis period, such as the recent subprime meltdown, as well as the liaison between officials and the Federal Reserve System and private participants. The third reason for the Federal Reserve Bank of New York's prominence is that it is the only Federal Reserve Bank standard of the Bank for International Development. Thus, the President of the New York Fed, along with the Chairman of the Board of Governors, represents the Federal Reserve System in its regular monthly meetings with other major central banks at the DIS. This close contact with foreign central bankers and interaction with foreign exchange markets means that the New York Fed has a special role in international relations, both with other central bankers and with private market participants. Adding to its prominence in international circles, the New York Fed is the repository for more than $100 billion of the world's gold, an amount greater than the gold up for Finally, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York is the only permanent voting member of the FMC among the Federal Reserve Bank presidents. Serving as the vice chairman, that's he and the chairman and the vice chairman of the board of governors 
All right, so questions or comments on what we read? <coughs> so why don't you flip it over? And just to kind of refresh our memories of what we did last time. So Board of Governors, how many people? Seven. Seven. Federal Open Market Committee? Seven. Seven. Plus, plus New York. So remember, the governors are different than the Federal Reserve Bank presidents, right? So you've got how many banks, Federal Reserve Banks? Twelve, scattered throughout the country. Right? Each one of those has a president at it. So the Federal Open Market Committee, the purchase and sale of bonds, which is their most important function in terms of controlling uh, interest rates, um, or influencing interest rates, has the seven members plus the New York president plus four others. Who are the other four? Yeah, so they're on a rotating basis of the other four from the 12. So New York is automatically in, and then there's four other seats that rotate uh, for the Federal Open Market Committee. All right, um, the three tools of the Fed. <coughs> what are those? The three tools of the Fed. I'm just asking you to read. I just want you to make sure you got where there. Reserve requirements, open market operations, and the discount rate, right? Those three bubbles at the bottom. So really know that chart or start to be uh, comfortable with it. Um, by the way, these readings that we're doing are out of your textbook, so this is saving you a little textbook reading time. But it kind of allows us, I don't know about you, but one of the reasons I do this too is that I used to skip the little boxes when I was in your seats. I would kind of like, oh, that's just some extra stuff I don't really need to know. Well, this stuff is pretty interesting in terms of the topic. So rather than having you potentially skip it, um, I wanted to do a little popcorn. All right, so let's continue on our popcorn with uh, uh, inside the Fed, the FOMC meeting now. So this is how the meeting rolls out. We left off with Chisholm, right? So, or no, uh, Joe, so Dallas. The FOMC meeting takes place in the boardroom on the second floor of the main building of the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C. Seven governors and the 12 reserve bank presidents, along with the secretary of the FOMC, the board director of research and statistics division and his or her uh, deputy and the directors of the monetary affairs and international finance division. Sit around a massive conference table. Although, along with, uh, although only five of the reserve bank presidents have voting rights on the FOMC at the given time, all active participants in the deliberation either out of the size of the border or the directors of the research at each of the reserve banks and, and other senior board and reserve bank officials who, by tradition, do not speak at meeting. The meeting starts with a quick approval of the minutes of the previous meeting of the FOMC. Yeah, the first extension agenda item number 9 is to approve the minutes of the meeting of the manager of system open market operations on foreign currency and domestic open market operations and other issues related to the I think the governors and reserve bank presidents may have some questions. <coughs>
my office week. The chairman did summarize the discussion and proposed a super program for the monetary policy statement and directed on the federal funds with target transmitted to the open market test, indicating whether the federal funds may target this to be raised or lower, say by one fourth of a percentage point, or be left unchanged. The Secretary of Health and C formally agrees to this whole statement. Then there is an informal buffet lunch while eating the breakfast and cereal presentation on the service components and on the subject section of the legislation while it's effective this way. 2 15 p.m. The public comments can be made in regard to the outcome of the federal funds that are targeted in this country have been raised or lowered or left unchanged. Assessment of the balance of risks in the future. Post meeting down for the identification is initiated in 1994. Before then, no such announcement was made. The The decision to announce this implementation was a step in the direction of greater openness by the Fed. A further step in this direction started in April 2011 after the FOMC meetings in April, June, November, and January. The chairman of the Federal Reserve gives a press conference in which he briefs the press about the FOMC decision. Okay, so I got some other notes there. Remember, this group meets eight times per year. That's the one we watched with mm -hmm. Janet Yellen. So approximately every six weeks is, is when they come out. Um, so this, these, these narratives are kind of interesting to think about what really goes on at these board meetings. and. Uh, one of the issues we're going to talk about in this chapter is the, the independence of the Fed. And so prior to 1994, they didn't even tell people what they were doing, or they didn't have to. Why do you think they went away from that? I mean, in some ways you could argue it would be more effective to kind of do behind the scenes without letting people know um, what actions they were doing and then people just had to kind of figure it out. Accountability. Okay, accountability could be part of it. So some people have advantage. I think that's probably one of the bigger things, yeah. Because you got to think that somebody would know the trading desk person and they would see that person making some moves and then so maybe J.P. Morgan knows what's going on, but nobody else does. You know, information would kind of rumor and stuff like that. And so I think it ended up causing more volatility and uncertainty than they thought it was, uh, that, that it was more harm than good. And so they changed to this full announcement setup. But uh, uh, that was fairly recently. So that was 1994. Um, so that hasn't been around all that long relative to the how old the, the Fed is. So. All right, any other questions, comments? All right, keep that sheet. We're going to call it a day there, uh, but we got one more we're going to do on the back. 